Hello, and welcome to the leadership in the new normal. So what happened in the new normal? Let it be clear that things would get better, but nothing remains the same after the pandemic. Many industries, many communities have been impacted. All human life has been affected. I'm very honored and very privileged today to have uh, a really amazing group of participants. And I will briefly uh, discuss uh, professional bios of extraordinary group of leaders that we have here today all over the world. They're being represented from the state of California, the state of Colorado, the state of Ohio, United Kingdom, and uh, in the state of, uh, state of Texas, we have Suman joining us as well uh, from Singapore. So thank you for joining us from Singapore, and we're waiting for Sanjay to join us as well. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, who are listening to us and participating in this collaborative discussion. And welcome, Sanjay. Uh, great to have you with us as well. So we have a full crowd here today, six amazing leaders. What I want to do, if uh, possible, get, set the stage for this discussion, go over the bios and profiles, and then we'll go directly to the questions. Maybe the disruption was needed for the world uh, to go digital. We must accept the reality right now that many aspects of our work can be accomplished remotely, not all, but some. Suddenly, most professional workers today go online, either out of choice or corporate mandates. We see it at Google, Apple, Facebook, and others. All are following the mandates are uh, optioned from WFH, work from home. Work from home for such many employees may continue after this uh, horrible pandemic. What else is happening? We're going to discuss it today. People are drifting away from many cities towards other suburban and rural areas. Could this pandemic really decentralize opportunities away from few hotspots such as San Francisco, New York? According to Wall Street Journal, I recently read, the remote work revolution promises to change the way the Americans work and live completely. It will allow smaller cities, suburbs, and rural areas to compete with the superstar cities on the basis of price and amenities. It will shift the main thrust of economic development from paying incentives to big employers, to investing in building communities' quality of life. As communities attract more remote workers, their tax base will grow, allowing them to improve schools and public services, benefiting everyone. That was the statement uh, that came out at Wall Street Journal. The CEO of Microsoft, not represented on this meeting, uh, Satya Nadella, put it back in April. I remember this uh, quite vividly. He said, we have seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months, from remote teamwork and learning to sales to customer service. Everything of taken years is now taking months. Artificial intelligence, my favorite topic, uh, assumes a more central role in countless aspects of business and society. So has the need for ensuring its responsible use for our community and our citizens. Every day, AI and technology is being used now to make life-altering decisions, much more during the time of the pandemic. And I personally, um, being a digital technologist, following the new trends and looking at a future, I believe that it is important to meet people face-to-face -face in presentations. But now we're using new technologies. We're using... FaceTime, we're using Zoom, we're using WebEx, we're using this unique tool to run the world, which we're now speaking. And so people are now leveraging different uh, technologies and mechanisms. And that's the kind of the new world which requires new leadership and new commitments, uh, maybe new uh, frameworks, maybe new policies, maybe new regulations. And so it affects everybody emotionally, socially. And we're going to discuss all of this today. What I want to do right now is go over the bios of some of the amazing uh, colleagues that I have on this panel. First of all, a pleasure to have Honorable Mayor Patricia Lock Dawson of Riverside, California. Uh, she's a Riverside native and a small business owner, elected Riverside 18th mayor in November 2020. 
Uh, the Mayor Dawson's historic election makes her the first UCR graduate and second woman to be elected to Riverside's only citywide office in 150-year history. She comes to the mayor's office with extensive record of service to Riverside, previously served at every level of government, and most recently was elected trustee for nine years in the Riverside Unified School District Board of Education. Principal and owner of PLD Consulting, Mayor Dosen has been instrumental in passing legislation on securing tens of millions of dollars in state and federal funds for regional conservation, habitat, infrastructure projects we'll discuss today, well known as the state champion for Santa Ana River. Uh, our next uh, distinguished uh, panelist and guest is Marie Zanis, a fr- uh, based out of London, United Kingdom. Marie is the head of the asset management in EMEA, responsible for the governance, operations, business development, and talent for Northern Trust Asset Management. Marie is the CEO of Northern Trust Global Investment um, uh, uh, in United Kingdom, sits on the boards of Northern Trust Global Funds, Fund Managers Limited, Northern Trust Investment Funds, Everything fund-related, uh, she sits on for sure. Marie serves as the Northern Trust Asset Management Executive Committee and Northern Trust EMEA Executive Committee and has held executive positions at companies like BlackRock, J.P. Morgan, Smith Barney. A recognized industry leader was featured the top woman to watch from Investment News in 2017, a top woman in asset management award by Money Management Executive in 2015. Again, Impressive, impressive panelist. And now uh, a great, uh, impressive panelist from the healthcare space, Dr. Hal Paz from Columbus, Ohio. Hal is the first to serve on the position of the Executive Vice President and Chancellor for Health Affairs at Ohio State University and the Chief Executive Officer of the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, where he leads all seven health science colleges and a $4 billion uh, Wexner Medical Center enterprise, including seven hospitals and nationally ranked uh, College of Medicine, more than 20 research institutes, multiple ambulatory sites, an accountable care organization, and a health plan. Before joining Ohio State in June of 2019, Dr. Paz most immediately served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Aetna, where he led clinical strategy and policy of intersection of Aetna's domestic and global business. We're going on to another amazing uh, panelist, Sanjay, who is joining us uh, from Silicon Valley, California, Sanjay Punan. Sanjay is high-tech executive with extensive large company entrepreneurial enterprise IT experience in general management, uh, engineering, product management, sales, marketing, uh, business development. He's particularly adopt and scaling new business and turnarounds in multi-billion dollar sizes. He is the current chief operating officer of VMware with responsibility worldwide for sales, services, support, marketing alliances, pretty much everything. Uh, he's responsible for the security strategy and business at VMware. And prior to that, he was at Platform Solutions at SAP and held executive roles at Semantic, Veritas, and Informatica. Going on further to uh, another colleague in the technology space, Tim Langley Hawthorne, um, uh, based in Colorado. Today, he is um, re- remote. Uh, and again, because of our future of work and remote capabilities, Tim is a people-focused high-tech and fintech executives, well-rounded of commercial and customer orientation. He is currently the senior vice president, chief information officer for Hitachi Vantara, a global high-tech subsidiary of Hitachi Group that is based out of Japan. Throughout his career, Tim has proven track record of taking new challenges and successfully leading complex change initiatives uh, across all geographies. As the CIO of Hitachi Vantara, Tim is responsible for global information technology functions supporting Hitachi Vantara's 10,000-plus global employees and the company's transformation to focusing on edge-to-core to cloud digital infrastructure and solution. Tim joined Hitachi from Western Union, where he had several global technology operations. Finally, impressive uh, background of of our colleague Suman Bose. Suman is from Singapore, joining us today. Suman is the co-founder of GoFAR, a growth advisory investment and operating firm focused on the United Nations SDGs, GoFAR aims to meaningfully better the lives of the next billion people globally by leveraging frugal innovation technology 
and network of partnerships and ecosystems around the world. Before GoFar, Suman has spent over 30 years in executive leadership positions globally with Fortune 100 companies. You can name them all. Siemens, Dolsal, Hewlett Packard. He was everywhere in the United States, globally, around the world. So we have, uh, uh, we have an impressive group of leaders here today. And, uh, and what we want to do now is we want to go directly um, to them and speak about some particular things that may unlock the, the new normal and how does leadership play a major role in the new normal. The first question that I have for you, Mayor Patricia, prior being a mayor, you spent your career in the environmental science space. Uh, what made you choose this field? And do you feel of great importance to this field of science today than 20 or 30 years ago? Oh, thank you, Mark. And I want to say thank you to all of our uh, co-speakers co here. I feel very honored to be in your presence this afternoon. It's 3.30 here in California, so it is afternoon for me. But um, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, I, my career has been in environmental science. Um, that's I was a trained forester and wildlife biologist. And um, I, I found that I was a, a pretty decent scientist. I was a pretty good forester, pretty good wildlife biologist, but I was a better politician. And I found that even within those roles that I could effect more change by working in the policy realm. So um, I kept getting dragged into more and more policy decisions and um, creating policy. And that's how I got into appointed and elected office so that I, I felt I could do more there in that space. And to your question about, is it more important than it was 20 or 30 years ago? Uh, I had no idea I was a maverick back then, but apparently I am, um, particularly on the cusp of just this global climate change we're all in right now. So um, that, you know, body of information, that that uh, training is is important now more than ever. Thank you for this fourth world response, Mayor. I want to go directly. We want to, uh, we're in the month, um, uh, month of March that we're celebrating uh, achievements of our great leaders, our women who have achieved so much. So uh, thank you, Marie, for all you have done uh, for the causes uh, of uh, women, diversity and equality. And we want to go to you, Marie, on the question of what do you think will be required leadership traits that leaders will require for the success in the future? And um, thank you, everyone. I'm proud to be among great minds and uh, contributing on this topic. Um, the reason why this question resonates with me is for a long time, I have been a student of management and believed it was a calling and not just a station of where you were. And with that responsibility, Wall Street has evolved over the years. I was one of very few women um, who were in different uh, promotions and activities through the ranks and always thought about how to bring out the best in people, how to lead alongside of them, how to understand uh, surrounding somebody and giving them success. And um, it was only until late in my career that this really came into vogue where um, people surrounded and it was more around the psychology of motivating people, but learned so much along the journey. So topics like this resonate with me greatly as we think through that agility and certain the answer um, and, and leading through uncertainty and having the confidence and comfort actually could um, Thank you very much for this thoughtful uh, answer, Marie. And we want to go to uh, Ohio, and we want to go to Hal uh, with a question focusing on healthcare. Uh, Hal, we're beginning to feel more optimistic now uh, that we're approaching a time when COVID-19 is mostly in our rear view mirror. In your opinion, what impact has pandemic had on our future from healthcare point of view, but also others, for example, innovation and technology and economy and how do we address health and well-being? It's a, it's a great question. You know, uh, when I came here from uh, CVS Health Aetna about two years ago, 
I came with this vision to transform this large academic health system to becoming a health platform, to reach into the homes of individuals, to identify ways to improve health and well-being, to reduce premature death through leveraging things in the community, looking at social and behavioral and environmental determinants of health, but to use technology as a way to expand everything that we do. You mentioned earlier, we have seven hospitals here. We have the you know most sophisticated ICUs and operating rooms. And that's important for a lot of people, as we learned during the pandemic, when we were full of patients with COVID. Fortunately, those numbers have been going down quite steadily. But at the same time, if we don't get into the local community, if we don't address the things such as people's situations at home, food insecurity, housing, transportation, education, poverty, safety, then in fact, we know those things are incredibly important in terms of determining premature death and poor health and and well-being. Just as important, exercise, obesity, and addiction to alcohol, to drugs, um, and to uh, tobacco. Incredibly important determinants of health and well-being. And we've seen this with water pollution, air pollution, and now even climate change. All these come together in ways that have a huge impact on how we do. So that being said, it's hard to create change in a very short period of time unless something like a pandemic comes along. Across the healthcare industry in this country, it's estimated that uh, that just in the first few months of the pandemic, there was a 55% reduction in hospital admissions for anyone but COVID patients because we had to reduce PPE, we had to protect the workforce, and therefore created these huge challenges in directing care to everybody else. And it was incredible how telehealth, for example, played a huge role in this. Pre-pandemic, we were doing 50 telehealth visits a month here at this institution. Today, we do about 2,800 a day. We were able to ramp up in a matter of weeks using technology to uh, address this opportunity. We're learning now that uh, about 84% of, of patients have used telehealth for the first time. And more than half of these users report a satisfied experience as a result of this. And we think there are more opportunities to use digital solutions as well, because we think that, for example, using chatbots on our website is a way to communicate directly with patients on our website to answer their questions about COVID vaccination has been incredibly helpful. Here at Ohio State Wexner, we've done over 100,000 vaccines as of tomorrow. We can use this technology in a way to get patients through the system literally in less than 30 minutes. So this has really been a game changer. Will we go back to the way that care has been provided before? Some aspects of it certainly will, but a lot of it I truly believe will remain changed as a result of these opportunities to create a much more virtual experience and frankly, a much more equitable experience as well. Thank you very much, Hal, for, for this answer. And again, taking us through a very multidisciplinary, integrated approach. We can't just uh, look, you have to look at beyond, you have to look at the overall ecosystem and you mentioned how telehealth became substantial core component of our healthcare system, but not only, there's so many other aspects that came out. I want to go across the world. Now we are using run the world application. We're going across the world and we are going to talk to uh, Suman. Suman, um, I want to address a specific question, follow up what Hal has been touching upon, but really go a little bit more beyond business and uh, be, what would the new normal look like given your focus on society given your focus on education food for healthcare uh, other things what do the goal achievements look like towards the un sdgs and sustainability with this new normal uh, well uh, first of all uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be uh, with all of you today um, and it's, it's a very we hours in the morning over here and i think the uh, you know the, the panel was so exciting that it it's it's worth it and it's surely it's been worth it. So, Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. So my belief over here is that uh, things are uh, not going too well as far as uh, meeting of the twenty thirty goals are concerned. Uh, uh, you know if uh, if if uh, we do not believe in luck, then uh, um, there's very little hope unless we really do something about it. I mean, let's just take the area of food. One of the areas that we have recently doubled down upon and invested in uh, in 
you know, it's an unprecedented set of hunger that the world is uh, hurtling towards. Uh, you know, the, the all the gains the world has made since the past 15, 20 years uh, till about 2015, 16 has significantly started going down. It but was actually the numbers were already becoming very uh, difficult. And you know, although there's a percentage of the global global population, it was shrinking because the world population has increased tremendously over the past 20 years. But uh, in this year alone, approximately ex- expectation is about uh, 132 million more people will go hungry uh, over over what was happening last year. So this is like literally doubling the number. And uh, and this is when the world produces so much food that even if we just save 25 percent of the food that we actually end up producing, I mean, there would be uh, food for everybody and there would be money in the hand of the farmers, etc. You know, uh, for example, in South Asia and Africa, you know, on the farmers suicides at an all time high. Uh, I mean, that cannot be done work from home. You have to go and till that land. You will have to get to put that land, process that food onto a mechanism that reaches your and my plate and common consumers are paying twice, sometimes thrice for the same product. The products are shelved out. This, this isn't there over there. So I think this, this is a, uh, this crisis has also in my way, uh, kind of what COVID has done, the things were already that were going bad and we were kind of putting plasters to it to kind of keep the house uh, not fall over. But you know, these plasters are all over. It's, it's gone away. So things which were had to fall has really fallen. And it has completely opened and exposed uh, the problems that we all face. I just gave an example of food. I'm sure there are examples, tons of examples from health we have just heard uh, from. So I think there's a, but, and this meeting of minds that has to ha- happen and come together uh, has to be cross discipline. It cannot be a singular discipline problem. If you give it to a food technologist to solve this problem, believe me, the problem wouldn't get solved. Because you know they had the scape for the last twenty five years to do it, or if you give it to a healthcare professional to solve a healthcare problem, sorry for I mean, just picking it up on that. Maybe the problem will not get solved. So I think this is the time where you know the, the societal uh, work, uh, technology, uh, all of that will have to come together in cross discipline. And this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, as I say that you know this is the time when you have to stand up and get counted. This is the time you get stand up and get counted across the disciplines. That's my thank you. Over here. Thank you very much. You've given us a lot of food for thought, and you also have uh, you also told us exactly what's going on around the world. What could we do to make the world a little bit better uh, in uh, areas like uh, food supply and uh, education and healthcare and other things? So, thanks for that motivation and inspiration um, uh, from you. And we'll be back uh, with additional questions. Look, going from sustainability. And uh, the areas around the world and emerging markets, we want to go into technology. Technology doesn't solve all the problems, but it's critically important in the new normal. And with this, I want to go to uh, Sanjay, please. And with the question that I have in mind is, what have been, uh, you work for a, a massive global company, VMware. What are some of the biggest challenges and changes in technology industry that you have seen over the last year? And where does VMware, particularly over the past year, play, uh, continue to play uh, post COVID 19? I think you're on the mute. Okay. Yeah, famous three words of last year were you're on mute. Uh, but uh, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be with all of these distinguished guests. And how beautiful is it to be able to go within seconds from Ohio to Singapore to Silicon Valley and all over? Uh, with the power of incredible video technology. Uh, you know, the last time the world went through a crisis, um, you know, not as intense uh, as COVID has been on lives, but it was a deep financial crisis, it was 2008. And I remember I was at SAP at the time, and um, I was working with 10 or 15 other people in this small room with this uh, really hot, um, it generated a lot of heat, video uh, uh, technology called telepresence, and only 15 people could sit in the room and if you wanted to stay warm, you stayed near that machine and everybody else had to be on phone lines. And when I first saw Zoom, uh, I know the CEO pretty well. He's a friend of mine. I said, Eric, this is like telepresence on my phone. This was 10 years ago. And that technology has been made for our time. Who would have thought? And now, thanks to this, um, some remarkable things are done. So what we did, I mean, it's almost exactly a year ago this week that we sent our 30,000 people uh, to shelter in place, primarily in the United States. Many of the other Asian countries are already doing that. In Europe, we did the same thing around the same time, and everything in our life changed. 
But we were able to take advantage of technologies of these times. And I told our employees, uh, all, you know, all of our key uh, folks, listen, the most important thing is your health and safety first. Take care of your health. The profits of VMware will wait. Your health and safety is more important than the profits of VMware. And take care of your families because this crisis is one of health and so on. But if you're healthy, then let's turn our attention to our customers. So you want to always empathize with your employees because it's really difficult. Many of them have got children at home. Uh, they're trying to juggle being a parent, helping their kids with their schoolwork um, and cook and, you know, all the kind of stuff. And, of course, we know the mental stress people have been in one year later. But thanks to this type of technology, um, and we are part of the infrastructure that makes technology like Zoom even faster. I won't get into a plug for VMware. But um, we were able to really allow everybody to work remotely seamlessly. I mean, it was like within a drop of a hat, we were able, I mean, the, the word V in VMware is virtualization. So we understand yeah. a lot about how to make virtualization happen in a very seamless fashion. Uh, and I will tell you, there's something that I learned through that process too, uh, beyond empathy. You know, people who work from home always felt like second class citizens to the people who work at work because you they dial in and you'd, you would never be able to get your word in edgewise. Now that's forever changed. Everybody is like a remote worker. We're all in an office of one. And every Zoom meeting, sorry, every meeting we set up has a mandatory Zoom meeting and that will stay forever. And I will tell you, we will never treat the person working from home and remotely as a second class citizen. And that applies not just to the workplace, but also to the school. When a kid is sick, the person, the kid would come back to home or the, the parent would send them to school because they wanted a free babysitter. No, every classroom should have a, a camera and a microphone. And the, the student, if they're sick, can go back home and not miss a beat on the classroom. So I think these types of technologies have forever changed our, our world. Um, many of the things that we've seen in a work from home has facilitated some incredible use of technology. One of our hospitals um, began to set up uh, hospital beds in parking lots and in um, you know garages because they're running out of capacity in their rooms and they needed faster networking access into those makeshift uh, beds. We were able to do that. So the use cases of what we've seen of faster accelerating our customers in this world where virtualization and things of those are paramount has been incredible. And we've used that as a learning opportunity to help us take some digital technologies even faster and faster in the future. Sanjay, thank you. You took us into the future. You also gave us an interesting illustrative examples of use cases, what really, how technology really enables our future that we are becoming more virtual, but yet we're connected. You know, when people say about AI, you know, you mentioned a few things. When people talk about, oh, it's uh, technology, but it's really humans that are behind it. And if you focus on a human centric approach, a human technology um, that provides intimacy, we will all be better off. So thanks for that, for that encouragement and, and giving us the view from technology. We're going on with technology. Technology is almost everywhere we're seeing. And Hitachi is the force of social innovation, right, Tim, globally all over the world, one of the largest social innovation companies. And as a global leader working at Hitachi, what are the corporate values? that has been helpful to you personally and your organizations over the over the past year, over this difficult pandemic year? Yeah, thank you, Mark. And again, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel today and, and meet all these uh, other fantastic panelists spread around the world. You know, I, I work for Hitachi. We're a, a little over 110-year-old um, Japanese company with a, you know, very deep history of, of innovation and, and, and really providing uh, to society. And our three corporate values are harmony, sincerity, and pioneering spirit. And those three corporate values have been the corporate values for decades now. You know, they were shaped by the founders of the company. And those of us that are leaders in the company now, it's sort of entrusted upon us to continue to live those values and, and grow those values. So, you know, we we actually did an activity at the company where we sort of all reflected on those values and it was asked, you know, which one of those do you think is the most important to you at this time? This was in the in the early days of the of the pandemic. And and for me it was really that pioneering spirit. Um, so as a as a technology leader, um, you know, we were sort of thrust forward very early in this. Um, as, as Sanjay said, you know, technology is really a great enabler that allowed 
you know, those of us that have employees that we needed to send home very quickly to be able to keep working. So, you know, I've, I've said to my team, I have this saying that 2021 is going to look more like 2020 than 2019. Um, and, and not in a bad way, but I really challenge the team to think about that pioneering and spirit and say, think about all the things that you did in 2020 that you never thought you would have been able to do before, right? The things that we were able to do that we never would have thought possible before and, and keep hold of that and keep thinking of that and keep onto that pioneering spirit and don't fall back into how we were doing things in 2019. You know, take the best of what we did in 2020 and let's take that to go forward. So I think, Mark, that pioneering spirit has, has really been that corporate value that I've really tried to live this this past year and really keep uh, continuing with my team. Thank you, Tim. It's really your, you hit on the points of pioneering. The pioneering leaders are the ones that are di- have advances in diagnostics, the people that are making a difference in terms of forecast models, the people that are helping us with uh, supply chains around the world. And really the pioneers are leading this effort. And it's a combined effort. It's public private partnerships, not one, you know, it's not the government that could do it alone, but it's combination and the values. And speaking about the values, I want to bring the discussion back to you, Mayor Patricia. And there has been a lot of discussion in the media discussing leadership is, as Tim mentioned, it's a responsibility and every other, uh, uh, every other participant on this call mentioned that it's we're responsible for our people, for our employees. It's not just about profits. What does it mean to you? And what are some of the lessons of leadership and responsibility? Specifically, I, um, COVID-19 pandemic radically changes ways the companies and cities and communities conduct business. People continue to be very uncertain uh, about the future. A lot of com- miscommunication. Leaders like us, are responsible for even more now to uh, citizens, to their employees, especially that are being faced with unprecedented levels of change uh, and stress, stress uh, uh, with teachers, stress in medical facilities, office settings, as I think Sanjay and Tim mentioned, uh, uh, office settings and related culture as being replaced by working at home. And it's becoming a norm. It's becoming an accepted norm. People are not worried about providing, um, uh, people are, are, are not worried about um, uh, the things that are, uh, that are things that are in front of them, uh, te- if technology or engineering. They, are, they want to make sure that the basic needs, the safety, the health of their loved ones are the ones which are being taken care of. So the uh, uh, question to you is, what does leadership uh, uh, responsibility mean to you as the mayor of American City? It's about your people. True. You've hit on that, right? That's, um, and politics specifically government is, um, we are in the business of people. We are in the business of relationships and not just our people here, but the people we serve. So when the pandemic hit and we sent everybody home, we were faced with the question of how do we continue to provide services to our residents? Because it's, it's, it's all about the interactions with people. So we had a hybrid model. We had some working from home, some in the office, but that's a challenge as a leader. Who gets to be here? Who gets to stay home, right? How do you make sure that your services are being delivered in a high, excellent quality when it's a mixed bag of people? And I think the other thing now is uh, we're looking at is bringing people back. How do we do that? And in the United States, as I'm sure it is in many other countries, our meetings that we conduct or our city council meetings, our um, governing boards are all conducted in public. That has been an enormous challenge. It's been an enormous challenge to figure out how do you do it? Do you do it like this? Do we all sit in the same room? Do we have callers call in? And the technological challenges, I love it. Maybe I need to talk to uh, the VMware people because (laughs) we've had such difficulty you know, our bandwidth capacity, all of these things, it's been difficult with, ha- you know, having people call in. And one other thing, which has been an unintended that I would ne- have known, our, we are the biggest city in the county here, and we are the center of, of Riverside. We have 330,000 people in our city here. And when our government 
Buildings are shut down and people are not here. Our streets are empty. Restaurants closed. Businesses were vandalized. Crime increased. We had people leaving. And now our downtown core is very much a, a bit of a ghost town. So now we're challenged with bringing businesses back, um, you know, opening back up again. And um, so that's the leadership is not just my people here, but my people out there, right? And having, being able to provide a thriving, flourishing economy post, post uh, COVID. Thank you, Mayor. It's really all, all inclusive leadership. We can't leave anybody behind and, um, and caring for our vulnerable uh, is critically important in this, in this environment. Nineteen uh, uh, era. What are the requirements? What are the challenges? And how would the leaders maintain engagement and enhance performance during a very difficult time of change and uncertainty? Starting from the point of asset management and particularly countries like. And um, um, so, so it's 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 a monitor monitor of they made the the future of the Marie, we're getting some technical difficulties. Uh, okay, now it's better, but I think we were getting some technical difficulties. Hopefully, it's okay. Can you hear me now? So, so it, it requires. No, we are there. The, no. the the sound the sound got this uh, the sound distortions, and I don't know about everybody else, but we're having uh, some challenges here. So, Marie, maybe it will get fixed. But uh, meanwhile, we'll we will go we will go as the sound issue get, will get fixed. I don't know what's happening. Maybe it's an issue overseas, or maybe we need better uh, compression or virtualization. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have to go back to Sanjay to help us with this. Run the world program. We'll have to see, but uh, but I want to go now. Uh, I want to now go to uh, as we hopefully we'll get the sound issue fixed. I want to go to how uh, regarding the uh, the question for you is how does after COVID nineteen new normal business look like, especially in workplaces, and you're seeing it in all your organizations. Do they does did do they get permanently disintegrated into the traditional workplace? Is it a hybrid environment? Uh, are you know people brought the issues of virtualization everywhere? How do we prioritize? How do we stand? What are the standards? What are the governance? Maybe give us a little bit of a perspective of this new normal picture that will take place in the workplace. Sure, thank you. And a little bit like Suman's example earlier in healthcare, like agriculture, we have to show up to work. There is no way we can do all that virtually. We have thirty thousand employees here. And I would think that half are going to have to be here. The other half could work from home. They could work in other locations. And I suspect a lot of that will be hybrid, where we want to give individual employees a choice based on their own circumstances and then make sure that we're an effective organization and conduct our business that way, quite frankly. And I think that adaptability and, and that, uh, that kind of work environment will continue to make us more successful and more competitive, number one. I think to do that effectively, it's really important from a leadership perspective to be able to convey this vision for the future. And, it, you know, as we learned this past year, it always has to be optimistic, but it has to be measured in reality as well. To do that well means communicating over and over and over again. And I think that's an important lesson we learned this year. Use multimodalities to communicate broadly to our workforce. If you don't do that, there's tremendous confusion there is distrust, there's a lack of focus across the board. And when so many individuals are working from home and have so many other challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, that becomes extraordinarily important. It addresses the issue of loyalty, it addresses the issue of trust, and it certainly addresses the issue of fidelity in terms of the communication. That's one piece. The second piece are the people, as we heard from the mayor just a minute ago. We have to attend to not just now what goes on in the workplace, which is what we've been doing for years, but it's really thinking holistically about each employee. We have to think about physical well-being, 
mental well-being and burnout in healthcare is a huge issue. We have to think about financial well-being. Raising the minimum wage was one of the first things we did here a few years ago. It's extraordinarily important. We have to make sure that our employees are socially connected, that they feel a sense of purpose, and that they're engaged. Because if we do that well, then we have a well workforce that will, in fact, do great work here in our organization. And I think that's an area that's really one that we have to attend to, particularly given what many have predicted will be a K type of recovery across the country and even globally, where the disparities will grow greater for some if we don't address these. And for others, there'll be continued success. As employers, we can't allow that to happen. And the only way we can address this is across our workforce, but also in the communities that we work. I would argue that's our civic and our corporate responsibility. Thank you very much. I know we have limited time and I want to go quickly to the rest of our panelists uh, before they cut us off. I don't know how the system works. Uh, hopefully it gives us a little bit of a chance to cover the point. So I want to go to you, uh, Suman, uh, in Singapore. You're seeing United States from different lenses. You're seeing our leadership, what we have done in the previous years, what worked, what haven't worked specifically on sustainability, on social impact, on our accomplishments, how we were fighting, uh, you know, the pandemic and what we were able to uh, get across in terms of uh, the new, what, what kind of new standards, what, what would be your recommendations? This meeting is about the United States as we move forward uh, from, uh, what are your recommendations from Singapore and touching upon obviously all inclusiveness and sustainability? So first of all, I think, uh, you know, it's very early to call anybody that anybody is a very uh, completely successful or a failure because, and I think it's still evolving and the heroes of yesterday or last month uh, have kind of have bitten dust and some new leaders have emerged. So I think the world will see that move happen. But we also understand that the United States uh, also represents in a way uh, uh, in every country because there's like technologies uh, that comes from the U.S. The, the policies that you take have impact across the world. So in a way, U.S. manifests itself across the world and not just in the U.S. So in a, it, it's a very balanced. So I think U.S. and the second part of it, the manifestation of U.S., it continues to be very dominant. And I, I would say that needs to become better. For example, I see it. I, I, these days I work in, in Africa a lot and I, I, I find the United States, uh, quote unquote, missing in action. I think I think you know, U.S. has to really pick up its uh, stuff in Africa because that's a land of opportunity as well as you know, we need to really, really start focusing over there. Uh, but on the other hand, for example, I see uh, very positive outcomes in the last few uh, weeks and months. And the world is watching uh, and, and world is taking inspiration from how a situation can rapidly be changed. Uh, and I think there's a lot of lesson for the world to, to take it over from there. So I'm personally very, very positive about uh, U.S.'s leadership in the world and, and the way the U.S. can be integrated more than leadership, integrated as a fabric with the rest of the world. Thank you very much uh, from those words. I want to go to our, our technology leaders and pose that question to both of you. Um, uh, Tim and Sanjay, I want to pose the question of technology, obviously unlocking new ways of working in post-COVID world. Uh, where, where, where is all of this going? Uh, is this world going to be hybrid? Are we going to get more artificial intelligence automation? Are we going to get Robux type of work environment with avatars? Can you comment a little bit about what you're seeing, Sanjay, in terms of technology automation and where all of this is going into the future? And the same question for you, Tim. And then I uh, hope maybe we'll get uh, a, a short response, uh, a viewpoint from Marie, because we were not able to hear her well as well. Yep. Uh, please, Sanjay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if you get a little bit of background noise. Uh, the beauty of working at home is that when you have a little bit of construction work going on, uh, you pick that up in the microphone. But hopefully you can still hear me OK. Yes. Uh, I think uh, technology is like, you know, this sort of age old thing. Is it a good or a bad? Um, it's like the match, right? The match that lights a fire. You can either use it to keep yourself warm or you could, um, you know, burn down a house. And we as um, technologists, as leaders in society, and it doesn't matter whether you're a technologist. I'm happy, by the way, to be the IT person for all of you, including Mayor. I will call you after this meeting to help you set up your computer. No problem to be your, your private CIO. Uh, just send me an email after this meeting. But nonetheless, um, I would say that, from our perspective, we as technologists or, or world leaders have to find ways by which we 
use technology for good. Artificial intelligence can be used to help you drive faster from location A to location B. That's the easiest example because uh, you think about how your driving in the past was driven by maps and pieces of paper and now something guiding your car or, you know, and even self-driving cars. I mean, people get a lot of, of, of uh, you know, kind of pent up stress driving in traffic. And there is complete safety to the future of self-driving in uh, stop and go traffic because a car, a computer will stay more alert than we as human beings uh, will be. So all of this can be used. But when AI is used in a way that invades privacy, uh, potentially makes you feel at risk, when it's using to uh, do things that you worry about, is spying on you, uh, could be invasive. That's a place where we have to have good ethical discussions to the appropriate places where we use this, um, you know, um, uh, maybe too far. And all of that applies to, I'm just using AI as one example. Um, and, and I think in general, same thing applies. Is automation and AI going to replace uh, human jobs? I think what happens, this is the age old debate. The society starts getting to higher and higher production jobs. When the word processor came out, people didn't argue that all of a sudden all these people who are typewriting and people who wrote by hand, spell check became beautiful because everybody started getting better and better writers with a word processor. So I think that technology used for automation or AI will actually create higher level jobs as opposed to taking away jobs. And many of those jobs that are in the mundane